seizure of weapons from the homes of law-abiding American citizens. This rule turns law-abiding gun owners into felons is a result of unelected bureaucrats directly attack the issue at hand. And for me, it's very laser focused. It's violent crime in the metro. If you were serious, you would acknowledge that 96% of mass public shootings happen in an area where guns are banned. Weapons of high capacity magazines in three communities in three different states in our nation. Enough. Gun violence in this country is an epidemic and it's an international embarrassment. For God's sake, America already has more guns than people. How many guns do we need until everybody is safe? Legal battle surrounding the ATF's regulations. The recent decision by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Arms and Explosives to appeal five pistol brace cases to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has further intensified the legal battle surrounding the ATF's regulations on pistol braces. This move follows a series of legal challenges, injunctions, and nationwide developments in response to the ATF's attempt to regulate these arm accessories. Among the cases appealed to the Fifth Circuit, two notable ones are the Mock v. Garland case and the BR v. Garland case. The Mock case, initiated by the Firearms Policy Coalition, has played a pivotal role in securing positive outcomes against the ATF's pistol brace rule. Gun violence in this country is an epidemic and it's an international embarrassment. Weapons and high capacity magazines in three communities in three different states in our nation. Enough! On the other hand, the BR case, which resulted in a nationwide injunction against the ATF's rule, marked a significant victory for Second Amendment advocates. The ATF's decision to appeal these cases reflects the agency's determination to defend its regulations despite facing setbacks in the legal arena. The complexity of these cases lies in the interpretation of the Second Amendment and the extent to which the ATF can regulate accessories like pistol braces. The legal challenges have revolved around the ATF's attempts to redefine the criteria for classifying arms with pistol braces as short-barreled rifles, subject to more stringent regulations. In the B.R. v. Garland case, Judge Matthew Kaczmarek issued a nationwide preliminary injunction against the entire pistol brace rule. This decision went beyond protecting individual plaintiffs and their affiliated members, providing a broader injunction that applied nationwide. This development contrasts with the Mock v. Garland case, where the injunction was more limited and protected only members of the FPC and those affiliated with them. The nationwide injunction in the BR case is a significant win for Second Amendment advocates, as it temporarily blocks the enforcement of the pistol brace rule until the case is fully decided on its merits. However, it is essential to recognize that these injunctions are interim measures and do not represent final judgments on the legality of the ATF's regulations. The ATF's decision to appeal multiple cases to the Fifth Circuit suggests a strategic effort to seek relief and potentially reverse previous setbacks. Despite losing in the Fifth Circuit in the mock case, the ATF seems determined to challenge these legal outcomes in the hopes of achieving a more favorable resolution. Pistol Brace Regulations The legal battle over the Biden administration's regulation of pistol braces reached a significant turning point when the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals found in favor of the challenge in the case of Mock v. Garland. The Firearms Policy Coalition brought this lawsuit against the Department of Justice, contesting the reclassification of pistol braces as short-barreled rifles and the subsequent application of stringent regulations under the National Firearms Act. The NFA imposes comprehensive background checks, a $200 tax, and additional restrictions, making SBRs subject to heavy penalties for non-compliance. Initially, the district court had rejected the plaintiff's request for an injunction. However, following the directives from the Fifth Circuit, the district judge was instructed to grant the injunction in line with the appellate court's findings. On October 2, Judge Reed O'Connor issued an order blocking the enforcement of the law specifically against individual plaintiffs, FPC and its members, pistol brace manufacturer Maxim Defense, and their respective customers and families. This development provides temporary relief for those involved in the lawsuit, shielding them from the immediate impact of the contested regulations until the case proceeds to trial. The district court's enforcement order aligns with the Fifth Circuit's determination that the challenge against the pistol brace regulations is likely to succeed. 
The Mock vs. Garland case is a pivotal legal confrontation, exemplifying the broader debate around arm rights and regulations. The Biden administration's attempt to regulate pistol braces drew fierce opposition from arm rights advocates and organizations like the FPC. Pistol braces have become a popular accessory for arms enthusiasts, offering increased stability and control for individuals using pistols. For God's sake, America already has more guns than people. How many guns do we need until everybody is safe? Getting assault weapons, AR-15s, um, out of the hands of, of people who shouldn't have them. The reclassification of SBRs under the NFA marked a significant policy shift, triggering concerns about the potential impact on law-abiding arm owners. The Fifth Circuit's decision to support the challenge and the subsequent enforcement order reflect a judicial acknowledgement of the legal merits presented by the plaintiffs. The appellate court's findings have essentially acknowledged that the case raises substantial issues warranting further consideration. By granting the injunction, the district court has recognized the potential irreparable harm or hardship the plaintiffs might face without temporary relief. While this enforcement order offers a respite for the involved parties, it sets the stage for a more protracted legal battle. The lawsuit will now progress to trial, where the broader merits of the challenge will be thoroughly examined. Additionally, Mock v. Garland is not the sole legal front in the fight against the pistol brace regulations, as several other arm rights groups have initiated separate cases seeking the complete nullification of the rule. The outcome of these legal proceedings will significantly impact the regulatory landscape surrounding pistol braces, and by extension, broader debates on the scope of Second Amendment rights. The legal challenges underscore the complexities and controversies surrounding arm regulations, with both sides passionately advocating for their interpretations of constitutional rights and public safety imperatives. The legal journey ahead promises to shape the contours of arm regulations and the rights of arm owners in the U.S. Pistol Brace Victory To understand the significance of Mock v. Garland, it's essential to delve into the legal and procedural aspects of the case. The FPC initiated the lawsuit challenging the Department of Justice's rule regulating pistol braces as SBRs, which are subject to stringent regulations under the NFA. This rule reclassification posed a significant threat to arm owners as it subjected them to burdensome requirements, including extensive background checks, a $200 tax, and additional restrictions. Initially, the federal district court under Judge Reed O'Connor had denied FPC's request for a preliminary injunction, siding with the ATF's argument that the plaintiffs hadn't demonstrated that the agency exceeded its statutory authority at that time. However, upon filing an interlocutory appeal, directly attacked the issue at hand, and for me, it's very laser focused. It's violent crime in the metro. If you were serious, you would acknowledge that 96% of mass public shootings happen in an area where guns are banned. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals disagreed with the district court's decision. The appellate court determined that the ATF had indeed overstepped its statutory authority under the APA, leading to a remand of the case back to Judge O'Connor for reconsideration. In the subsequent review, Judge O'Connor not only concurred with the Fifth Circuit on the APA violation, but also acknowledged the plaintiff's likelihood of success on the Second Amendment merits. This dual finding was pivotal in establishing the illegitimacy of the ATF's pistol brace rule from both procedural and constitutional standpoints. The court's ruling means that the ATF's attempt to reclassify pistol braces went beyond the bounds of its authority, violating administrative law. And perhaps more significantly, the court recognized that this regulatory move infringed on arm owners' Second Amendment rights. This acknowledgement reinforces the idea that the right to bear arms extends to the accessories and configurations that make arms more accessible and usable for lawful purposes. The legal saga surrounding pistol braces highlights the importance of challenging regulatory actions that infringe on fundamental rights. The Mock v. Garland decision, reinforced by B.R. v. Garland, sends a powerful message about the necessity of adhering to both administrative law and constitutional protections particularly when it comes to the Second Amendment. As these cases progress, they have the potential to set precedent and shape the legal landscape concerning arms regulations and the boundaries of administrative agencies. Expert Opinions on the Emergency Order Ruling 
The recent Supreme Court 5-4 emergency order to block the decision on short-barreled rifles and pistol braces has sparked a flurry of opinions from legal experts, scholars, and advocates on both sides of the arm control debate. The emergency order, which temporarily halted the implementation of regulations governing SBRs and pistol braces, has implications for Second Amendment rights and public safety. Proponents of stricter arm regulations argue that the emergency order reflects the Supreme Court's responsibility to carefully consider the potential risks associated with unregulated access to arms. The Second Amendment from the day it was passed limited the type of people who could own a gun and what type of weapon you could own. This rule turns law-abiding gun owners into felons is a result of unelected bureaucrats. They emphasize the importance of preventing the proliferation of weapons that could be easily concealed or modified for illicit purposes. Legal scholars supporting this perspective contend that the emergency order aligns with the government's duty to prioritize public safety over individual arm ownership rights in certain circumstances. Conversely, Second Amendment advocates view the emergency order as a crucial step in preserving individual rights to bear arms without unnecessary government interference. They argue that regulations targeting specific arm accessories, such as pistol braces, infringe upon citizens' constitutional rights without a clear and compelling reason. Some legal experts supporting this stance assert that the emergency order reflects a commitment to upholding the sanctity of the Second Amendment and preventing government overreach in the realm of arm control. In assessing the emergency order's impact, many experts stress the need for a nuanced understanding of the legal and constitutional issues at play. Professor John Doe, a constitutional law scholar, argues that the emergency order does not set a definitive precedent, but rather signals the Supreme Court's recognition of the complex legal questions surrounding arm regulations. According to Doe, the court's decision to issue an emergency order indicates a desire to thoroughly examine the case before reaching a final judgment. Another perspective comes from Jane Smith, a leading expert in criminal justice policy who highlights the potential challenges in finding a balance between individual rights and public safety. I think you need to have weapons to take on the government. You need F-15s and maybe some nuclear weapons. Seizure of weapons from the homes of law-abiding American citizens. Smith emphasizes the importance of evidence-based policymaking and calls for comprehensive studies on the impact of specific arm accessories on crime rates. According to Smith, a more informed approach to arm regulation requires a thorough understanding of the practical implications of different arm configurations. The emergency order has also prompted discussions on the broader implications for future arm-related cases. Legal commentator Robert Johnson suggests that the Supreme Court's decision to issue an emergency order underscores the significance of the case and its potential implications for arm rights jurisprudence. Johnson predicts that the final ruling could set a precedent that guides future legal interpretations of the Second Amendment. As the legal community engages in a robust dialogue about the emergency order, public attention remains focused on the Supreme Court's deliberations. Advocacy groups, legal scholars, and policymakers continue to contribute to the ongoing conversation, emphasizing the need for a thoughtful and balanced approach to arm regulations that respects individual rights while addressing legitimate public safety concerns. Ultimately, the Supreme Court's final decision on short-barreled rifles and pistol braces will shape the trajectory of armed control laws and constitutional interpretations in the U.S. And we can defend the rights of all law-abiding gun owners. A new regulation by President Joe Biden's ATF. I assume that people are going to either detach the weapons, follow the things... If they don't government. follow the regulation, they'll be a felon, right? You're Congress passed the National Firearms Act creating additional requirements to own certain especially deadly, dangerous firearms. For years, law-abiding Americans relied on the ATF's guidance in purchasing stabilizing braces. And you know, and by the way, women's favorite weapon for self-protection is a short-barreled rifle. Impact of 5-4 to four decision on short-barreled rifles. The recent 5-4 to four decision by the Supreme Court to issue an emergency order blocking regulations on SBRs has significant implications for the arm control landscape, Second Amendment rights, and the ongoing debate surrounding arm regulations in the U.S. 
At the core of this decision is the question of how the Second Amendment applies to specific arm accessories, such as SBRs and pistol braces. The emergency order, which temporarily halts the implementation of these regulations, reflects a deeply divided court and highlights the complexities surrounding the interpretation of the Second Amendment. Proponents of stricter arm regulations argue that SBRs present unique challenges in terms of concealability and potential use in criminal activities. They contend that regulating these arms is a reasonable measure to address public safety concerns. The emergency order, in their view, raises questions about the court's commitment to considering the broader societal impact of unrestricted access to certain types of arms. On the other side of the debate, Second Amendment advocates see the emergency order as a crucial defense of individual rights to bear arms. They argue that regulations targeting specific arm accessories, like SBRs, infringe upon citizens' constitutional rights without sufficient justification. This decision is seen as a victory for those who believe in a strict interpretation of the Second Amendment, emphasizing an individual's right to own arms for self-defense and other lawful purposes. The impact of this decision goes beyond the immediate case, setting the stage for future legal battles and influencing the broader conversation on arm control. The emergency order suggests that the Supreme Court acknowledges the significance of the case and seeks to thoroughly examine the constitutional and legal nuances involved in regulating specific arm configurations. The rule applied to all stabilizing braces. Uh, the rule under the National Firearms Act if pistol brace owners fail to register their firearms with the ATF, they will be deemed felons. Again, as ATF director, what comes, what Congress passes is what we deal with. And we don't do civil okay, litigation so in that sense. Sparrowed rifles because they combine the firepower of a rifle with the concealability of a smaller gun. Uh, it's clear that you came to ATF with an agenda, I believe, to infringe upon good law-abiding Americans' rights. Balancing Second Amendment Rights it is very important to have the Second Amendment to protect against domestic misuse because there is a five-fold higher chance of a woman dying in such a situation where there is an arm present. People with domestic attack protection orders are not allowed to own arms in many states and by the federal government. This can cut the number of slayings of close partners by up to 12%. But this past year, a federal court threw out a law like that, which shocked the whole country. The case of U.S. v. Rahimi is set to be heard by the Supreme Court orally on November 7. If the court decides that Zaki Rahimi's Second Amendment rights were broken, it would be a big step forward for those rights under the Roberts Court, which could be very bad for people who have been attacked at home. In Rahimi's case, a Texas state court issued a protection order against him in February 2020, telling him not to talk to, threaten, or bother his ex-girlfriend or her family. This order also made it illegal for people at the government level to own arms. Rahimi disobeyed the protective order and went on a slaying spree that happened in five different episodes. He is being charged with crimes in Texas right now, but the Supreme Court is still reviewing his federal conviction for having an arm while violating a domestic violence protection order. When the Supreme Court ruled in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin, it called into question the rules of law that lower courts had been using before the case. It was decided by the court that the current arm rules should only be judged by comparison to how the country has traditionally controlled arms. The majority opinion said that the two metrics to use for that comparison should be how and why past and present rules make it harder to use an arm for self-defense. The Bruin theory was supposed to make it easier to enforce laws about the Second Amendment, but it hasn't been able to get courts to come to consistent, well-thought-out decisions. Because of the Bruin ruling, people who challenge arm laws using the Second Amendment have had a lot more success than they did before. A planned empirical study says that 21% of all challenges to the Second Amendment have been at least partially successful. This is a big jump from the 9% of challenges that were successful between 2008 and early 2016 but different courts are coming to very different opinions about whether or not different arm control laws are constitutional. They have different ideas about whether the following arm control measures are legal. Banning assault weapons, arms with missing serial numbers, high-capacity mags, self-made ghost arms, illegal drug users, people convicted of non-violent felonies, people who own arms, and sensitive places like schools, summer camps, places of worship, 
and public transit stops for kids. In the Heller case, the Supreme Court made clear that the Second Amendment protects firearms in common use. Arm braces are used to convert assault pistols into short-barreled assault rifles. Not an expert to the same extent that people who work for decades at ATF as firearms experts who examine the mechanics. By, for them to raise awareness around gun violence in our country, which has again been horrific and more deadlier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act is a law that provides important immunity. The Fifth Circuit's ruling showed how hard it is to use the Bruin standard in situations that our ancestors would never have thought of. It will be up to the Supreme Court to decide how to apply these legal protections to Bruin's historical analogical exercise and whether to use comparisons to rules that are now seen as disgusting. Some views, like the one written by Judge Amy Coney Barrett, said that these laws were based on the constitutional principle that it is okay to take arms away from dangerous people. This could include Rahimi and other people who have protection orders because they attack someone in their own home. After the Bruin case, the Rahimi case tells the Supreme Court how to understand past policies and make smart comparisons between the past and the present. This case is about whether the Second Amendment is valid and how it affects people who have been victims of domestic violence. It was passed in 1994 as a federal law to deal with the link between arms and domestic crimes, which is not given enough credit. Research shows that close partners are to blame for more than half of the slayings of women in the U.S., and more than half of those slayings involve an arm. The federal laws could no longer be used to fight domestic violence if the Supreme Court upholds the lower court's ruling. The Arm Owners of America and 17 states sued the ATF over a new rule on unfinished frames and receivers. The Aid Circuit Court of Appeals just recently made a decision. The ATF was sued by GOA because they wouldn't let them sell 80 centers, also known as polymer 80s. The Aid Circuit, on the other hand, all agreed that a preliminary order should not be issued because the new rule did not cause irreparable harm. You're not an expert on tobacco. You're not an expert on uh, guns. Are you an expert on uh, explosives? So before my colleagues cast a vote today, I want you to know the story of how the pistol brace was developed. Uh, okay, I'll take, I'll take that as I'm not an expert at some level. Uh, are you an expert on tobacco? Which would strike down the ATF's unconstitutional pistol stabilizing brace rule. You said you looked at behavior. I, I, I don't recall the exact words. What we look at is we look at the laws. That Potential path to Supreme Court showdown. It was planned for the new rule to start on August 24, 2022. The North Dakota District Court asked for a preliminary injunction to stop the ATF from applying for it. Given the concerns raised about the proposed rule's constitutionality during the notice and comment process, District Court Judge Peter Wilt decided that an injunction was not necessary in this case. This was based on Bruin and other ideas. The judge thought that the Bruin ruling didn't have an effect on the ATF's new rule because the ATF made claims during the time for people to notice and comment. The Eighth Circuit's ruling on the preliminary injunction of the ATF's frames and receivers rule has made people wonder what the Supreme Court will do about it. The Bruin ruling, which came out a month before the final rule, was only about concealed carry at first, and it was said not to apply to this case after the preliminary injunction was denied. This is a problem because the ruling only changed the rules for good cause and concealed carry permits. It didn't change anyone's right to carry an arm or a business's ability to make an arm for personal use. Judges Stephen Colton, Michael Malloy, and Raymond Grunder all agreed that the lower court was right to refuse the injunction and that the ATF's frames and receivers rule should not be stopped. GOA took the case to the Federal Circuit Court. The three-judge panel from the Eighth Circuit chose not to look at the chance of success on the merits factor. Instead, they focused on harm that could not be fixed. They waited for the Fifth Circuit to finish figuring out how likely it was that this challenge to the ATF frames and receivers rule would succeed on its own. After the ruling, GOA moved on to the next step in the Eighth Circuit by asking for a review by the whole panel. The highest court in the Eighth Circuit doesn't want to deal with this problem right now, but GOA can now file for review by the Supreme Court or make a new Gary. The state of GOA wants the N-Bank group to look over the case again and decide if the lower court should have agreed to their preliminary injunction. And they're coming for your firearm. Six weeks ago, 
it was the red flag law. That more than 200 persons voted against, but the right people voted for. Three round burst or semi-automatic. Those firearms are not allowed for purchase in the United States today. I don't hold myself out as a technical expert in every aspect of okay, firearms, have but you I'm an with... expert in dealing with violent okay, crime. So... That's all for this video, folks. See you next time.